gentlemen. Today for our remote lesson, I'm going to be talking about Spanish colonization uh, in the Americas. You could add that, but that's already a pretty long title. Uh, so that's what we're going to be looking at as we go through today's lesson. Uh, not a particularly happy one, fair warning, but uh, you know, just a remote lesson. So hopefully we'll get this in and done relatively quickly. All right, so the only thing you're putting here uh, is really this first bit um, that Columbus's discovery in sarcasm quotes in 1492 uh, led to the establishment of Spanish colonies pretty quickly through the West Indies and what is now Northern South America. Um, the people who Columbus encountered initially are called the Taino people and they were pretty much immediately obliterated. They had no chance against the Spanish, uh, not only because of the endemic disease, but because the Taino were mostly peaceful. Uh, you saw a little bit of that in your reading on Columbus's journal, which hopefully you've done. If you haven't, make sure you do that. Um, but yeah, the Taino stood very little chance of successfully resisting Spanish colonization. And we'll see that. You can look at the numbers if you want to pause. Uh, but about 90% of the Taino were dead within 30 years of Spanish arrival. Uh, and though they do have some genetics in and around the Caribbean, uh, they are a dead people since roughly the year 1550. So we're really starting out on a high note. Okay, so the reason I bring this up, and I know it's a wall of text, you can pause and read the whole thing, but I'm not going to bore you with all the guts of it, here's what you need to know. If you had to imagine a culture that had to meet new people, you probably couldn't come up with a culture less equipped to meet new people than Spain in 1492. We're talking about a militarized society, a religiously and racially intolerant society, and they are the ones who are going to encounter the Native Americans of the Caribbean and Mexico and all points south. So the Aztecs, what's left of the Maya, as well as the Inca. And that's going to go a long way. What you have underlined there, and the fact that Spain was deeply intolerant, is going to go a long way to explaining the rest of this lesson. So keep that in mind. So the first really big domino to fall, uh, wishing no offense to the Taino people who were the first to be conquered by the Spanish, the first big group was the Aztecs, who were conquered between 1519 and 1521 by Hernán Cortés in the Valley of Mexico. And it won't surprise you, and I hinted at it in our lesson on the Aztecs, that the Spaniards were helped by thousands of natives. You remember, the people the Aztecs were sacrificing usually were other Native Americans, and so the fact that the Spanish showed up meant that the Aztecs had to face not only the Spaniards, but also a massive rebellion of tribes which they had previously controlled. Now, it's easy to look back and go, why would these tribes have helped the Spaniards? Clearly, they were going to try to conquer them too. But it's important to remember that these tribes that helped out the Spaniards didn't know that. Now, after conquering the Aztecs in the 1520s, to the surprise of basically no one, the Spanish then did turn to conquering other native states and eventually carved out uh, a pretty big empire in central Mexico, fueled by the wealth of the conquered Aztecs. Down south, we see uh, the Inca Civil War, which we referenced, which runs from 1529 to 1532, and right as it ends, Spaniards under Francisco Pizarro showed up in 1532 and conquered the Inca Empire through ambush tactics. They successfully seized the Inca leader, Atahualpa, which is shown here in this image. Uh, that's Atahualpa, who I drew the box around. He is being grabbed by Francisco Pizarro. Uh, and Pizarro, by using ambush tactics, essentially conquered the Inca Empire in a matter of weeks. Other Inca retreated to the hills or the jungles to fight against the Spaniards, who didn't fully pacify the region for almost a hundred years, but the wealthiest part of the Inca Empire, the part of the Inca Empire that anybody would have actually wanted to own, the Spanish conquered it in 
essentially a matter of weeks. And what enabled the Spanish conquest, and I would highly advise that you simply pause because I'm not going to spend much time on this, but you need to know these three things. This is the most important lesson uh, for you today. Because the Spanish conquer these huge empires of millions with pathetically small groups. Like Cortes had fewer than a thousand men uh, total. Uh, uh, the initial wave, the really effective wave of conquest of the Inca Empire had 168 men in it. How did this happen? Well, the Spanish were able to do this conquest through three factors. One, technological supremacy. Guns, steel, horses, um, gunpowder, weaponry, armor, that sort of thing. Two, existing enemies of native empires. The groups that the Inca and Aztecs had been uh, taxing and subjugating, and in the case of the Aztecs, sacrificing, uh, they hated the Aztecs and Inca and figured that the Spanish couldn't be any worse. And lastly, probably the biggest one, disease, the real killer, which we'll talk about uh, near the end of today's lesson. Disease fatally weakened any hopes of resistance. Uh, I'm in the historical camp that even if the first wave of Spanish colonization had not succeeded, the seeds of disease that they planted would have enabled someone to take over this region. Okay, so the Spaniards immediately turned their profit their colonies into profit machines. They wanted to make their colonies as profitable as possible. They sought precious metals, and where they couldn't find precious metals like gold and silver, uh, they turned those areas into agricultural land for cash crops. Now, what you need to be aware of is that especially applies to northern South America as well as the Caribbean. That region that I've just circled, and yeah, including that coastline, is a hot spot to grow sugar and coffee. Uh, but we're also going to see the Spaniards and other Europeans grow tobacco and cocoa as well to turn profits. So the economic basis is going to be precious metals like silver and gold or sugar, coffee, tobacco, and cocoa. Sugar was the big one, by the way. If you have to know one crop to know, no sugar. So the immediate impact of Spanish colonization of the Americas was not the establishment of plantations or of mines or anything else. It was a population crash. It was the number of natives dying in a way that we really can't appreciate. Like, it's difficult to know exactly how many people there were in the Americas upon Spanish arrival, but let's assume that this chart is... Let's assume this chart is even half accurate, that there were only 10 million people instead of the 21 and a half million people proposed by this. We know, thanks to, um, thanks to various censuses, that the population of Mexico in the 1570s was about 2 million people. So what that means is, whether the population crashed by 90% or only 80%, it's still a it's still a disaster, guys. Like, look at these numbers. You see a population crash from 1545 to roughly 1549 uh, from this disease called Coco Leetsley that's going to kill somewhere in the ballpark of three quarters to 90 percent of the population of Mexico. That shouldn't happen. That's not normal. And one history book I read put it very well. Uh, the reason for this was because, A, Native Americans had no natural resistance to any Afro-Eurasian diseases, and B, they got all of them at once. So it wasn't just smallpox or measles or flu. It was all of them. And maybe your body could fight measles, but it couldn't fight smallpox. Or maybe your body could fight the flu and measles, but it couldn't fight smallpox. Or vice versa. You can read the subtitle to figure out what Coco Leetsley is. Um, populations crashed, and within a hundred years of Spanish arrival, somewhere between half and 90% of the native population was dead. 
Now, there are arguments where it's like, well, it would have been this percentage or this percentage, but you're missing the point. When the best case scenario is half of the population is dead, that's a really bad best case scenario. So we're going to kind of go through these last couple ones really quickly. Uh, one, you need to know where the Spanish colonies were. They're located throughout South America, except for Brazil, uh, Mesoamerica, as well as a pretty good number of Caribbean holdings, Caribbean islands like what will become Cuba and the Dominican Republic, and actually a lot of islands, including ones that aren't Spanish possessions um, anymore, like Jamaica, for example. Um, the economic basis is going to be sugar in the Caribbean and gold and silver mining in South America and in Mesoamerica. Uh, the relationship with the natives is atrocious. We're not going to go into too much detail on that one. Just know that the relationship between the Spaniards uh, and the natives is awful. It, it's bad even by the standards of... Uh, American relationships with Native Americans, if that gives you an idea. Most of the work done in Spanish America was done by Natives, and that's going to go a long way to explaining why this was as bad as it was. In fact, we're going to see a new caste system developed. So under this colonial system, a strongly racist society develops, and you have to be aware of that. Uh, here we have a full breakdown of what that society would have looked like, but I'm going to give you the, I don't want to say highlights, the important classes. So at the very top of this society were whites, uh, whites born in Spain, outranked whites born in the Americas, but they were never a large group regardless. Um, and beneath them were mixtures of natives as well as um, excuse me, mixtures of natives and whites. Uh, those groups of people were called mestizos, and they're eventually going to make up the majority of people living in the Spanish colonies. Under those uh, groups were different mixed race peoples, followed by Native Americans and African slaves at the bottom of society. Uh, so as you can see, this is a society that's a lot more racially diverse than uh, the society that we will see in a minute develop in the English colonies, or not in a minute, in our next lesson, excuse me. Forgot I broke those up. Um, but understand that this is by no means a racially harmonious society. And here we see an image that's normally taken to be kind of a casual, fun thing. I use this in all of my classes, and you may be looking at this and looking at the title and going, McDowell, why is this terrible? Well, because what you're looking at is not a fun family frolic. What you're looking at, and you can kind of see if you notice the text at the bottom here, what you're actually looking at is a racial identification guide on what to call mixed race people. These are called Casta paintings. And just in case you think I'm cherry picking, there's a lot of these and they went into a lot of depth telling you okay, I am a mixture of white and Native American. My wife is a mixture of Native American and black. What is our child? That sort of thing was actually looked at throughout the Spanish colonies. And they had names for all of these people, most of which are offensive and none of which I'm going to tell you. Okay. Now, there is one... I don't want to say bright side, but this will explain kind of looking back on what we just talked about. Spanish born women didn't move to the new world uh, in anywhere near the numbers that we saw from, for example, English women. And so white Spanish born women would actually have a lot more autonomy in choosing a partner than they would have in Spain. They would have had more rights. Um, by extension, Spanish men in the New World, whether peninsulares, that is, born in Spain, or creoles, born here in the Americas, would marry Native women at much higher rates than pretty much anywhere else. I mean, even the French colonies can't compare to how many Spanish men married Native women. 
and that's what creates that racial admixture that's going to become a hallmark of the Spanish colonies. Now, if you read down at the bottom, understand that the idea of white Spaniards marrying native princesses was pretty much exclusive to the higher levels of society. Native women who married Spanish men in the lower levels of society were frequently subjected to truly horrible domestic abuse. Now it is worthy to remember, I didn't underline this bit, but uh, what you really need to be aware of is the last bullet and to a degree the first bullet. The Spanish colonies, because they were established by the 1500s, uh, existed a lot longer than the other colonial powers. Uh, Mexico, for example, was a colony for 300 years. Cuba was a colony for almost 400 years. And I bring that up because compare that to the Americas, uh, excuse me, what, what will become the United States of America, which was only a colony if you go from Jamestown to 4th of July, uh, it was only a colony for about 170 years. So you see a lot more Spanish influence in the Spanish colonies than you do English slash British influence in what will become the United States of America. There's also um, a lot of Native Americans mixing with Spanish culture, and so you see distinctively a mixed culture in what will become the Spanish colonies, uh, which remains today both as a reminder of how long the Spaniards were here and that the natives never quite gave up their own culture. Thanks guys for sticking with me, and I will see all of you on Wednesday.